I hope you are all having a fabulous time here at the Extreme Hangout. Our next storyteller session is about to begin, so we highly encourage everyone to sit down, relax, and get ready to hear this fabulous human being we're going to have here on their stage. Her name is Sarah Sabri. She is a tribalizing astronaut, and she is also the founder of Deep Space Initiative, and she stands as the first Egyptian Arab woman and African woman to ever go to space, making history with her pioneering contributions. As the executive director and founder of Deep Space Initiative, she, she champions accessibility in the space field, fostering global opportunities for research and education. Currently pursuing a PhD in aerospace sciences, Sarah's NASA-funded research focuses on the next generation of planetary spacesuits. So let's please all give Sarah a huge round of applause and thank you for being here, guys. Woo! Thank you. I'd like to start by apologizing for my voice. It's a little bit gone, so you know, these things happen at the best time, so it's happened today. Um, it's a privilege to be standing here today with you at COP28 in Dubai, and thank you so much, Extreme Hangouts, for organizing such a beautiful event, and thank you for each one of you for being here. And so I'd like to talk to you today about how to call for action through the space perspective. Um, how do I change those slides? Oh. So growing up, I was always told not to study engineering. So, but I would also like to tell you that I was always drawn to the uncharted, to the unconventional. I was always drawn to the things that were, seemed like a fantasy around me. I was a dreamer. I was always imagining things that weren't really a reality around me. And I never really saw myself in anything that was around me at the time. I grew up in Egypt. My mom is Lebanese and my father is Egyptian. And then we didn't have rocket launches. We didn't have women doing extremely big things. We didn't have any of that. And when you grow up in a place like this, you can either let your environment dictate what you can or cannot do in your life, or you can just accept and, you know, take in whatever is, and everyone is telling you and just kind of let that push you forward. And a key factor in my journey is this wholeness approach to growth. And what I like to call it is this wholeness approach, is this holistic approach, meaning that you can't only focus on one aspect of growth. It's not only about knowledge, it's not only about fitness, and it's not only about you know, the, the experiences that you have. It's this combination of everything, and it's in this interconnectedness of everything. I studied mechanical engineering in Egypt with focus on mechatronics, worked in Formula 3 cars, and then did my master's in, yeah, sorry, did my master's in biomedical engineering, where I worked in stem cells for a little while in robotic surgery, used AI for increasing autonomy in surgery, and then currently I'm doing my PhD in aerospace. My interests have shifted along the way, and my experiences have grown and been very, very broad because I've always focused on problems. For me, it was always about seeing those problems and trying to find solutions for them. And for me, I also realized that this knowledge, this growth, is not only in classrooms. It's not only what you learn in, at work. I worked in industry as well for some years, and I did a lot of different things in augmented reality and different, um, in different fields. But it was also about this approach where you need to also have this, this understanding of what's actually happening on the ground. During my undergraduate degree, I was also a CrossFit coach and yoga instructor, and this taught me so many valuable lessons about discipline, about teamwork, and about perseverance. When you're standing in a position where it's very difficult and your body really wants to, to give up, and you don't, when you pass that barrier, when you think that you're almost going, we were going to give up, but then you don't, that's something that does change, changes something in you. And the biggest lesson that I've learned from this whole physical understanding of, the, the, of our bodies was that limits only exist in your brain. And I'd like to share with you a little story. When I was coaching one time this all-women's fitness class in Cairo, it was a it was a class in the evening, in the middle of the week, on a Wednesday, I believe, and it was an all-women's class, middle-aged women that had finished a long days of work and came to my very brutal, brutal class of um, high-intensity interval training. 
So after a 45-minute workout, I told them, okay, let's, we're gonna just finish with a really strong finisher of a plank. And I'm sure all of you here who have done planks before know that time passes very differently when you're in a plank position. So I told them, okay, we're just gonna do about 30 to one minute plank, it's gonna be, you're gonna be done, you're gonna feel great, you're gonna go home, it's gonna feel amazing. And then, um, I think we're passing slides. <laughs> anyway, um, and then I told them, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna um, um, yeah, so we're gonna just do a one minute plank and then you're gonna feel amazing. So I put them, I asked them to all sit in a plank position, all facing one another, just to have this encouragement, just for them to be looking at each other, encouraging one another. And then instead of, and by, I had, at the time I had read a paper about those limitations that only exist in your brain. And that this man had experimented with this using different tools and different scenarios. And I wanted to try that out myself. So instead of setting a timer, I set a stopwatch. And so I asked these women to sit in a plank, started the stopwatch, and I asked them to just hold it. So at first, they were huffing and puffing. They, couldn't, they didn't want to do it. They were very resistant to the idea of doing it. And then one minute had passed, and they were still standing in position. I saw they had proper form, still encouraging one another. Everything was great. Everything was perfect. And then two minutes had passed, and then they were still holding it. Of course, struggling, sweating, didn't want to do it. And then three minutes had passed. And mind you, these women are middle-aged women. They're not athletes. They, have, they're not, they don't do this all the time. This is not something that they love doing. They're not really motivated about like, really like, pushing and competing. And then four minutes, and then five. These women, after a 45-minute day of workout, and after a long day of work in the evening, had stayed in a plank for five minutes when they thought that they couldn't do it for 30 seconds. So this shows you that the really limitations only exist in your mind, and it's not something that is really true. And that's similar to a lot of different things in our lives, that to really think that things that we think are limitations are not really limitations, and I think it's just how you, you change your perspective towards them. And after I finished my, my, grad my bachelor's degree and before moving on to my master's, I, worked in, I decided to take some time and volunteer around the world because I wanted to get an understanding of what was actually going on in the world and have boots on the ground and really see the challenges that people were facing. And through that experience, I have learned so many life lessons that were bigger and much more than I could have learned in a lifetime. But the biggest thing I learned was that the importance of emphasizing empathy, how the power of community, how when you're, even when you're struggling, when you have basically no resources at all, if this community stays together, it's, it's so powerful in a way that we cannot even understand. And we're seeing this now, we're seeing this, this new age of the, the, the social media and being in this digital world, how that's affected, affected us. When we don't really understand that even with little resources, with nothing at all that we th take here for granted, just access to water, access to food, that we take for granted is this comfort that has led us to not really put a lot of effort in our community, in our surroundings. And that was something that was extremely valuable that I have come to use at the, at the later stage of my life. The, my search for answers and my search for problem solving has led me to the space field. And through that, I wanted to really try to see if I could push humanity to become multiplanetary, because for me, that was always something that really was mind-boggling. How are we not multiplanetary? How are we not a space-faring civilization? So I decided to conduct some astronaut training myself, and after doing that for a couple of years, um, next slide, please, I got the call that I was going to become the first Egyptian, the first African woman, and the first Arab woman to go to space. I got the call on July 20th of August of 2022 on the Apollo 11 moon landing, which is a very, very special day. And getting the call and being told that you were going to become one of only 630 people since the beginning of humanity to see Earth from space is quite unbelievable. But I remember the moment where it all clicked in place, where it really felt like it was actually going to happen, is this moment right here. The moment that I saw the rocket that I was about to, about to be launched into space on for the very first time. And this, when you go to space, um, this is the view that you see from space. 
And seeing art from space really does change something in you. There is this term called the overview effect, and it's this change in perspective that happens to you when you see Earth from space. It changes how you view the world. It changes how you, your understanding about the world. When you see this very thin blue line, and you understand that that's literally the only thing protecting us from space, this is the only thing keeping us alive, you develop a, a very huge sense of responsibility towards it towards both our, both our Earth and humanity. You develop this sense of understanding about the unity, about the interconnectedness of both humanity in itself and Earth with space. We always talk about Earth and space as two separate things. This is kind of like in our language that we use because we always say that we're going into space. We never really say that we're leaving Earth. We know, all know here that Earth is in space, right? Like this is something we all know. But when you see it, when you leave Earth and we see how close it actually is, when you see how easy, kind of, relatively, to leave our Earth and to really see it from the outside, and how small it is, it really breaks your reality. And I have to say it was probably, a, it was not probably, but it was the most profound experience of my life. Another very important thing that I have come to draw from this experience as well is that there are no borders on the map. These borders that you see on the map, on papers, or on the globe, or anything, they are make-believe. They have just been drawn by man, by men a couple of centuries ago. And they have created all of these disparities that we see on our Earth. They have created disparities in opportunity, in the value of life, and how you are treated as a human being. And we have seen all of these geopolitical conflicts that we have seen all over the world, created by, and that are caused by, these lines on the map. Next slide, please. So coming back from space, I have committed my life towards creating change, towards taking bigger risks, and to giving voice to those that don't have one. Because I, once upon a time, did not have a voice either. I am a woman from Egypt, from a mother who was a refugee, from a dad who started from nothing. So being here on stage with you today and to have a voice and to talk about the challenges that we are facing, both for climate and sustainability, but also towards human rights, is a responsibility and an obligation for me to be giving those voices to those who don't, can, cannot be heard. We are seeing what is happening now in Palestine, and we are seeing humanity treat itself in ways that we didn't think it, we should be treating ourselves this way. And I have to say that it is important for us to all acknowledge and to take responsibility towards really trying to create for change. We can't just be solving our problems that we see in climate, but we need to be solving the problems that we're facing here as humanity. We need to be using, looking at Earth from how we're seeing it from space and not how we're seeing it on paper. So amongst the commitments that I've made towards Earth and humanity, I found a Deep Space Initiative. And the mission behind Deep Space Initiative is to break those barriers, to erase the borders that have been drawn on the map that have created all of those disparities, to make the opportunities in the space field as open as they could ever be. We provide opportunities in research, education, and we work on the law and policy side of the space as well. We've had so far around 200 researchers and mentors. We, had, we have people from 28 nationalities. We have people that are working in the space field now that would not have otherwise have had access just because of their origin or their resources, which doesn't make sense. And when we're talking about commitment, there is another commitment that I have made as well towards Earth, and that is to try to help save it. So um, we use, in this company called Extrema Technologies, we're harnessing the power of algae for carbon capture. And our vision is not only to help solve the problems that we have here on Earth, but also to help sustain life and to help life thrive on a different planet, and possibly on space stations and beyond. And this is something that is extremely important, it's very, very passionate about as well, and I would be happy to talk to you about this in a tape, like, privately, if you'd like. And finally, Another very important aspect of when we're talking about commitments, not only is it commitments towards access to space, access to opportunity, and equality in terms of what you can and cannot do in your life, not only is it a commitment towards helping save our planet, which every single person here knows that it's important and it has committed to that as well, I'm sure, but it's also a commitment towards humanity itself, to all of us having equal rights, to all of us having equal voices, and to all of us being able to 
have a seat at the table whenever we're making those decisions that are going to be influencing the rest of our lives. So finally, I would like to leave you with this thought, that you always have a choice. You always have a choice to take responsibility. You have a choice to, take, to step outside your comfort zone, and you have a choice to take the risk. It took me to leave our Earth to really realize and see how fragile it really is. But I hope that we don't have to wait for all of us to be leaving our Earth to see that. But that today and this event and everyone here at COP, that we really try to use our collective empowerment and collective understanding of what is actually happening around the world to really push for action, to really push for change. And I really hope that we can all do that together. Thank you.